Oh, I guess I, two meetings in a row I forgot to do that, so thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is the Committee on Health and Human Services, Finance and Policy. Today's date is March 30th, 2022. Um, we're going to jump right into our agenda. Um, we've got uh, three bills in front of us, and we'll start off with Senate File 3699. Senator Abler. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and committee and to the public. Um, we've had quite an interesting uh, you know, session in this committee this year, and I don't know how you did it, Mr. Chair, but you actually saved the last two bill, the best two bills for last. And uh, I just want to thank you for that honor. Uh, one bill is as compelling and one is very important. Um, the first one is Senate File 3699, which I'll move. Um, and I'm not going to even spend much time talking about it, but the, some of the challenges facing Families, when they need pediatric hospice, you can just conjure up all those stories. It's just very hard all around. And the point of this bill is to make it a little bit easier for those folks. So with that, I'll just turn to my testifier, Ms. Linda Felser, who's here to tell you more details. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, just please identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Yuki and Senator Abler. My name is Katie. Lyndon Felser, the founder and executive director of Crescent Cove. We have a children's hospice. We're licensed as a residential hospice here in Minnesota. We're one of only three in the whole country. And this bill is so important for us to be able to provide end of life care for children who have life threatening conditions or a shortened life expectancy. Our residential hospice in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota has six bedrooms for children. There's no out-of-pocket costs for the families who come for end-of-life care as well as for respite care. Um, so sometimes families come for a short break and sometimes for end-of-life care. We have nursing care 24-7 with nursing assistants, a medical director who's on call, a director of nursing and operations, a social worker and volunteer coordinator. And this bill supports providing care for children needing end-of-life care. And I'll introduce to you the mom of a boy named Malachi who died at Crescent Cove. And her name is Catherine uh, to share more about the need in our community. And I'll introduce Catherine who is online. Okay, thank you. And yes, uh, Ms. Williams, um, welcome to our committee. Um, thank you for joining us today and uh, just please identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your uh, testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Catherine. Um, I'm a mother um, of, a, of a son. My son uh, stayed at Crescent Cove. Well, my whole family practically did. Um, my son's name was Malachi. Um, around about his 11th birthday, he was born happy and healthy. Around about his 11th birthday, he started experiencing um, like falling and losing his balance and his gait and stuff like that. We brought him in and we went from the U to Mayo. And um, we, I heard about Crescent Cove from one of uh, uh, the nurses that we were working with about for respite care before we decided to go, before we were going there for my son's end of life hospice care. Um, we got a diagnosis um, a month, not even, about a month before we ended up um, going to respite um, to Crescent Cove. He was declining very fast. And so um, he had a disease by the name of Mikado Joseph syndrome. It, it, it affects your muscle coordination. Um, it controls the part of your brain um, that allows you to breathe. And he died from acute respiratory failure. But when we arrived at Crescent Cove, um, I'll just never forget how welcoming. Um, you can see my son's name all across the sidewalk and chart, uh, chart, uh, chalk art. And um, they had his name on the door when we came in. They greeted my whole entire family. Um, they celebrated his life. 
the whole entire time we were there. Um, they threw a concert for him. Um, they provided support for me and my whole entire family. Um, they loved on us. Um, I'll never forget when we walked in there after being there for a little bit, my son just stared out the window and he said, this place is paradise. And he was okay with that being um, the place. He knew he was in very good hands. He knew he was going to die there. And he knew these people were going to love on him as they did. And they took care of my whole entire family. Um, like I said, they celebrated him. They celebrated his life. And through a concert, they allowed me to just be his mother. Oh, did we? I think, did we lose you or did you just, or you finished? I th we're not hearing you. We lost your audio. Oh, we're still. Allowed. Oh, now you're back with us. Pardon me. We had lost your audio for a little bit, but now we hear you again. So you can continue. Um, they allowed me to just show up. I apologize for that, Mr. Chair. They allowed me to show up and just be his mom and to love on him and to have those final days that I had with him. To be precious and centered around just loving on him and saying goodbye. And I had been caring for him before we had went to... Um, Crescent Cove and I was just exhausted and I just really don't know what me and my family would have done if we hadn't if there hadn't been a place like Crescent Cove if they had not did what they did for us I can't even describe to you um, the support they continue to support us today and I'm really grateful um, that we had the opportunity um, to spend my son's last last days there. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, and we're sorry for your loss, but uh, thank you for your uh, testimony here this afternoon. Um, Senator Abler, before I take the next step on this, you did move your bill, but you've got the A-1 amendment. Would you like right. to move that now? Right, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to kind of get people to, to feel the bill, and you know, I don't know, you know, how Ms. Lynn Felser, Felser does this, um, and but it's just so nice that they're willing to. It's, mm -hmm. Anyway, it's pretty cool. And so this basically creates a Medicaid benefit so people could access this. And so there's an amendment, Mr. Chair. I'll move to A1. And uh, Mr. Monahan wants to explain it. That would probably be a good idea. Okay. Um, Mr. Monahan, would you like to uh, tell us about the A1 amendment? Mr. Chair, members, um, the amendment... Uh, strikes language in the underlying bill that would have set the rate for this uh, service to be equivalent to um, respite services that are provided under the disability waivers and instead inserts language saying that the rate for this service would be equivalent to 100% um, of the Medicare rate for home care hospice services. Thank you, Mr. Monahan. Members, uh, oh, Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mostly wanted to um, thank Senator Abler for bringing this forward. Crescent Cove is in my district, oh. and I've been there many times, and it's a wonderful organization. And um, it would be nice if they didn't have to hold fundraisers all the time and actually got some reimbursement for the good work they do. Okay, I'm going to go back to we need to vote on the A1 amendment uh, now that we've had uh, an explanation on it. So all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> amendment is adopted. Now we'll go to uh, further questions. Senator Benson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank the Crescent Cove folks for the obvious dignity and care that they give and the peace that they can bring to parents and to Ms. Williams um, that you were blessed with just being a mom uh, for those moments. And so when I ask these test technical questions, it's because I want this to work. Um, so Senator Abler, I know this is going to be laid over and a fiscal note will be developed. Um, and thank you for the clarity on rate setting, but is there a definition? I know from Medicare, there's a definition of hospice. It's 90 days, and so I'd like some clarity around that. And then the second is, is just, just for residential or would home hospice be available as well? Ms. Linden Felser. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your questions. This bill is specifically related to a residential hospice where children would come for end of life care. And there continues to be home hospice services provided by home hospice services providers in our community. Um, this happens to be the only place in our state where we serve children coming as an alternative to the hospital or their home to die. Um, that was one of your questions about the difference. And related to, as you know, with adult hospice and Medicare certification, to be eligible for hospice as an adult nearing the end of life, the prognosis needs to be six months or less to live. And we had some legislation completed in 2016 with the support of Senator Hoffman and Representative Zerwas handling and looking at the license so that we added language to the residential hospice license so that children who have complex, chronic, life-threatening condition could also stay at a residential hospice because when that license was instated in 2004, it was really with the mindset of adults staying at a hospice home. So we had that legislative work done to open uh, residential hospices also for children who have a life-threatening condition and a shortened life expectancy. And typically, when a child comes to Crescent Cove at the end of life, it's for the last two to seven days of their life. So we're not talking about covering costs that are 90 days or even, even 10 days usually. The average is five days. Thank you. Senator Benson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, anything further? Any more questions for Senator Abler or the testifier? I don't see any. Senator Abler, you can have final words and then. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks, Mr. Chair and members, and I, I think that the testimony has spoken pretty well for itself. Um, and, and so I, I just want to thank Ms. Linden Felser and the people that work with her there as just more amazing people who dedicate themselves just from the inside out every day. And I, God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler, and thanks to your testifiers today. So with that, we will lay this bill over. Thank you, sir. Senator Abler, you've got Senate file 3613. I should have done that one last, Mr. Chair. Um, anyway, so I'd like to move that, that one. So this bill is actually in a similar vein. Um, there are ways to help uh, young people with very challenging medical conditions actually live and, uh, and thrive in their homes. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonder, the, the level of care that can be provided in a home for people that used to, for kids used to be needing an intensive care place. And, and this is a, a topic about that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I wish it was a new topic to this committee. Um, it seems like there continues to be confusion that a person under 18 is not a Medicare recipient. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to my testifier and she will explain why that's important to know. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Ms. Zender. To our committee and uh, please just identify yourself and go ahead. Thank you Chair Utke and members of the committee. My name is Cami Ozender and I am the Chief Administrative Officer with Pediatric Home Service. Pediatric Home Service provides comprehensive hospital at home level of care which includes home enteral nutrition, high-tech respiratory support, infusion pharmacy, and various nursing services so that children can live and thrive at home and in their communities as compared to a hospital. I'm here today to speak 
specifically to the clinical nutrition program that we offer that more than 2,000 Minnesota children rely upon. This uh, benefit is currently administered under the Medicaid Durable Medical Equipment, or commonly referred to as DME benefit design. PHS and the children we serve may be familiar to many of you, as Senator Abler describes. After all, we've come to this table many times seeking your support because our kids are not small adults, and the Medicare program in which our Medicaid DME benefit is based doesn't fit uh, their needs. It doesn't represent the specialized pediatric products that they require, and very importantly, it doesn't support the clinical expertise that is delivered by healthcare professionals, again, to allow these children to be in their homes. I'd like to take a moment to thank you because time and again, you have supported our children and the unique services that they require. Uh, we are here in front of you today asking for that support again in two ways. First, we're simply asking to protect access to the existing services that, that are provided today in the same rate model that was actually established about five years ago following a conversation just like this one. So this bill allows us to continue to support our children in the same way uh, on a cost neutral basis. And it actually does something more than that. And this is where we're really excited because um, pediatric home service and providers like us believe it's part of our obligation to uh, create models that are appropriately designed and really take our fee-for-service system into value-based care where services are uh, oriented to quality care and clinical outcomes, where providers have accountability for the total cost of care, and finally, that simply break us free from the archaic fee-for-service models that are in uh, existence today. So this bill uh, creates a value-based model uh, that looks to capture and accomplish all of those things. We recognize that moving from fee-for-service to value-based is not um, an easy lift. It, cre it requires creativity and commitment, and so we've been grateful to be working with the Department of Human Services on exactly how that can work in design and ultimately how that can work in implementation. So once again, I thank you, Chair Utke, for taking time to uh, hear this important piece of legislation today. And I thank you for your past support of children with medical complexities and um, appreciate your time and available for questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Members, comments, questions for Senator Abler or the testifier? Mr. Chair, was the Senator department, Abler. Was the department going to comment or I, I don't, I mean, I would just be curious to have them explain again why this is such a critical matter to, okay. to try I, to undermine this essential service in the first place with their internal rate system process. Sure. Yeah, I don't have them on the list, but if someone from the department would like to um, testify to this, uh, turn on your camera and I see uh, Mr. Reese. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Gio Hayes with the Department of Human Services. Um, <clears throat> as you might know, uh, there's another amendment coming up, I think, later in the uh, meeting that targets a little bit more broadly the payments for enteral services. Um, as Ms. Sender has mentioned, we've been working with pediatric home services for a while now to talk about a value-based purchasing strategy um, for the services they provide. Um, these issues kind of interplay a little bit, but they're also a little bit unique and, and distinct in their, in their um, uh, nuances. Um, but the, the overarching issue here is that the, the statute-related intro product um, specifies a payment methodology called individually priced. And um, there are about eight different items uh, in statute that are supposed to be individually priced, and we are attempting to use the same methodology for all of those. Um, seven of them already use that same methodology, and about 50% of natural products also already use that methodology. So we're just working to um, streamline to make sure all the individually priced items are priced the same, and that has created some concern from our provider community related to the pricing for natural products. So we're actively working with pediatric home services, as well as MAIMS, the uh, trade association on a methodology that more appropriately reimburses parental products. Okay, thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and Mr. Reese, nice to see you again. It'd be better to see you in person, but I'll look at you up on the big screen there. It's like, oh, the big screen, you know, Oscar or something. Um, anyway, so I appreciate your comments, uh, 
and I, I just, and I just, I'm going to be very brief about this, but I don't understand why we, you don't want to understand, like the department, I don't know who the department is even on this topic, but the people there uh, down the road uh, continue to want to insist on treating these products like people that are on Medicare. I, I just don't understand that, and I, it seems to me that the legislative intent is really clear that we think they're different. Um, so that's just a comment, but I do have a question. Mr. Reese, and I don't know if you know this, um, I know that you've delayed this repricing until the end of session. Um, uh, has that, uh, do you know offhand um, if, was there a savings taken in the forecast that was then put off until June or until July? Uh, that if we, if we change the rule, uh, was, it, was that savings from starting July captured in the forecast? Mr. Reese? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Abler, we didn't assume any change in, um, in the forecast related to this change, savings or otherwise. Senator Abler. So, Mr. So, thank you. I, uh, I appreciate working on this. So, Mr. Chair, I'm optimistic that since there's not a need for the money, we can just solve the policy. And I want to commend uh, Pediatric Home Services and, and their peers coming forward with a step in the direction of value base, which is the direction we're all trying to go. And so, uh, Mr. Reese and the other to the people behind the bill, I'll encourage us all to uh, work that out. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Senator Abler. Members, anybody want to question before? Okay. Senator Abler, did you have any final words or if you want to just uh, move your bill? I see that uh, we've got this uh, being recommended to pass, and next stop is a finance committee. Mr. Chair, I'll move that and I'll thank members in advance for their uh, affirmative vote. Okay. Thank you, Senator Abler. Members, we have the motion before us that Senate File 13, 3613 be recommended to pass and re referred to the Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Senator Chair and members. It's been an amazing two bills here. I hope that you can enjoy the next bill. Thank you. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, first of all, I will move Senate File 4198 to be before us. And with that, um, this is our omnibus bill that's uh, been put together. We have got, I believe it's 14 different bills that we've all heard so far this session that have been included in here. but. Uh, to jump in quickly and uh, just kind of give us a high overview, um, Ms. Kavanaugh, if um, you would like Senator, to. Senator Aki, would you like to move the A2 or do you want Ms. Kavanaugh to describe the A2 and then we'll move it? Okay, I can. I will do that. A1. Senator Aki moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Or aye. Opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. Please proceed, Senator. Thank, okay. thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, was going from s s nothing to something, so okay. now we're there. And um, Ms. Kavanaugh, would you begin with the walkthrough, please? Madam Chair and members, it, there is, a, I think, um, in your packets, you have a list of the bills that are included in the, um, the DE amendment. Um, and there's nothing in this bill that we haven't already heard at this point. So these are all bills that have passed this committee or 
um, this session. So I'll give you just a quick rundown in terms of the sections. And Article 1 is Health Department. Sections 1 through 4 come from um, Senate File 1919, um, Senator Nelson's bill. Uh, this involved the regulations of the installation of the, the closed loop heat exchangers. Uh, sections 5, 11, 12, and 14 is Senator Benson's um, Senate File 1257. This um, exempted um, individuals that were licensed with, by a health-related licensing board from having to um, do a DHS background study if they were being employed by certain MDH um, facilities. Section 6 is a Bach bill, 2145. This um, exempts um, certain spa pools from the pool, um, public pool regulations. Section 7 is um, a hospital construction moratoriums exception. This is um, from Senator Drahan's 3257. This is the Children's Hospital mental health um, exception. Uh, Section 7 also includes some um, Senator Bach's hospital construction exception. That was a critical access hospital exception in 2704. Sections 8 and 15 is Senator Draham's Bill 3574. This um, simply transfers the administration of the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders prevention grants from DHS to MDH. Sections 9 and 10 are Senator Duckworth's bill uh, 3940, authorizing pharmacists to perform certain lab tests and vaccinations and allowing pharmacy technicians and interns to administer vaccines. And Section 16 is a Senator Howe bill um, 3201, which modified the requirements to obtain an MDH recommendation for the J-1 visa waiver program. Article 2 is the Department of Human Services. Section 1 is a Senator Coran's bill, um, 3580. This simply adds um, some information gathering on the DHS dental report um, that involves the number of dentists that are serving MA and Minnesota care in that report. Section 2 is a Senator Duckworth bill, 3940, um, requiring MA to cover um, vaccines and lab tests administered or ordered by a pharmacist at the same reimbursement rate as those services are covered um, when provided by other licensed practitioners. Article 3 deal with the um, health-related licensing boards and scope of practice bills that we heard. Sections 1, 13, and 14 uh, are Senator Nelson's um, 1364. This is establishing a interstate compact for audiology and speech language pathology. Uh, sections 2 through 10 and 18, this is Senator Rosen's Senate File 3071. Um, this is creating a temporary um, permit to practice medicine uh, for physicians, physician assistants, and um, respiratory therapists, and it also extends the period of the temporary permit that is already issued by the Board of Nursing. Uh, sections 11, 12, and 17 is Senator Nelson's um, 2302. This establishes the Nurse Licensure Compact. Section 15 is Senator Abler's 3355. This is establishing a Licensed Professional Counselors Interstate Compact. Section 16 is Senator Clausen's um, Senate File 3566, and this was modifying the criteria for prescribing controlled substances for the treatment of intractable pain. This Article 4 is the forecast and carry forward um, authority that was the, basically the underlying um, language in Senate File 4198, and that's it. Thank you, Senator Utke. Uh, it looks like we're going to do the amendments that have been noticed to the public and then take testimony. Is that all right with you, Senator Rutke? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Then first, uh, the A7, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the A7. And do members have that? Thank you. 
The amendment should be in your packet. Senator Nelson, please describe the amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this is uh, Senate File 980, which is restructuring and renaming the Minnesota Higher Education Facilities Authority as the Minnesota Health and Education Facilities Authority. Uh, we did uh, hear this bill last year. I'll give a, a brief description uh, just for, for new members. Uh, the bill expands the authority and scope of the Minnesota Higher Education Facilities Authority, known as HEFA, by allowing HEFA to provide financing to health care organizations. Uh, HEFA is a small state agency established in 1971 to provide an alternative method for higher education institutions in the state to finance or refinance capital construction projects by issuing tax-exempt revenue bonds. HEFA does not receive any general dollars nor any legislative appropriations uh, as the operating funds are paid from fees charged to the institutions that receive financing services. I'll be glad to take any questions, but I think members are likely aware of this. Uh, it's, been, it's supported by the Minnesota Hospitals Association. I do have uh, Mr. Barry Flick on uh, Zoom, uh, who is the executive director, if uh, you have any further questions. Obviously, HIFA um, is supporting this as well as uh, Minnesota Hospital Associations. And I would just note that the anacronym would stay the same, Madam Chair. It would be the Minnesota Health and Education Facilities Authority. Thank you. Questions from members to the A7. Okay. Any comments from the public? The A7. Okay. Seeing none, Senator Nelson moves the A7 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A7 amendment is adopted. Thank you, members. The next amendment in your packets. Um, see the 86. Okay, uh, we'll do the Benson A8 amendment. Um, members, this is technical changes. If you remember, we had. Um, changes to background studies for licensed medical professionals. There was agreement with the Department of Human Services, and as they prepare the fiscal note, uh, these changes needed to be made in order to create clarification, but this should be the last language change um, to get technical conformity as we move the changes to background checks for licensed professionals. Okay, and members, actually, we have an oral amendment to the A8 amendment on page one, line 11. The word and, I'm trying to describe it um, in quotations, who have and licensed issued to the board, delete the word and and insert a license issued by the board. Thank you, members. We'll incorporate that into the A8. Any questions to the A8 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A8 amendment is adopted. Thank you, members. Moving on, um, Ms. Strand recommends the A15 amendment. And members, this is also a Benson amendment. Sorry to be doing this. Um, if you remember, we had a request to the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services for reports to the legislature that would be expiring. The Department of Health did get us their report and this amendment deletes obsolete or deletes reports that the legislature um, no longer uses. And Ms. Kavanaugh, would you please help me in walking through the uh, reports that are being deleted here or there are some reports actually members that are being exempted from that section of statute because they are reports that are used by the legislature okay. madam chair and members um, so section one is exempting uh, the report 
that is required for um, the uh, Merck distribution, um, that money, those funds, and um, so this report would, uh, would continue indefinitely and not have to go through the, the reporting requirements in um, 144.05. Um, section two, this um, report it, you're, is, get, is we're getting rid of. So, um, and this is the inventory of biological specimens, registries, and health data um, and databases. So, this information will still be made public on the department's website, but the legislature will no longer get um, the report. Um, section three. Uh, uh, what was, oh, this is the contingency account um, and how it's spent. This report will be exempt um, from that, this um, reporting section, so this report will continue. Um, so the commissioner will still be required to um, report to the legislature about any spendings from the public health response contingency account. Um, section four is getting rid of of um, the, you know, on, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, um, myocardial infarction, fractions, um, something or other. Miss um, <laughs> Governor, it's the STEMI report, and we are deleting um, because we couldn't gather the information, I think, is what you told me, annually inform legislative committees about quality and patient outcomes because that information isn't something that is able to be gathered. Correct. And, the, and then there's, again, the summary report um, of the data in aggregate form is still going to be on the department's website. Um, then Section 5 is the Quality Improvement Program for the Nursing Facility Survey and Complaint Processes. This was um, thought to be something that was pretty important, so we are exempting this report, so this report will continue. Um, and this talks about the citations that um, are, are um, received from the survey process. Uh, section 6 um, is the annual report on home care licensing, this report will be extended for five years. Um, and then the legislature can relook at that at this that time to see if it's uh, still relevant. And section seven is, um, that's the abortion report. And this information is still going to be um, um, reported in a, a public report that the commissioner does, but um, the legislature will no longer get the uh, a separate report on this information. Section eight is the um, community health board uh, prevention activity funds. We're getting rid of the report to the legislature, and again, this report will continue to be made public um, and then the repealer oh, oh. is can I figure out what those are quick uh, the 62 U point um, one zero subdivision three is a is health care spending and projections um, from 2010 it's no longer um, even being done so we're repealing that um, 144-1911, um, subdivision 10, is the International Medical Graduate Assistance Program. Um, the reports is requ requiring recommendations on actions needed for continued progress. We're repealing that. Um, and let's see. Um, uh, section 144-564. Um, is um, monitoring subacute and tra transitional care services. Um, that's no longer needed. And let's see, what was the. I'm trying to find the. 
Well, these ones that we're getting are just not relevant anymore. Let's Thank see you. if I can find. Yeah, I'm looking for 152.25 oh. is the medical cannabis studies relating to chemical composition right. and dosages. And the 144A. I can't find. Let's see. Oh, here it is. Um, it's the Quality Improvement Program for the Home Care Survey and Home Care Complaint Investigation Processes. So, Ms. Cavanor, we were keeping the bigger version of home care. Of Quality. I think that's what we, right. We kept one home care report and let the other one go. Right, that's true. Right. Yes, yes. Sorry, this was just thrown together <laughs> this that's, morning. And, so and we sorry. did, and members and of the public, I apologize, mm -hmm. we got this report from NDH uh, rather recently and had to make some decisions. So that's why. Um, we're kind of doing this on the fly today. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I just thought I heard, but I didn't exactly see it here. Is Can you explain to me or show me uh, where in the document and, and why? Are we removing some reporting on medical cannabis? Did I hear that correctly? Yes. What is that and why would we be removing that reporting? We are removing, so uh, Senator Nelson, in 2014, when medical cannabis was enacted, we required the commissioner to report exist, existing medical and scientific literature regarding the range of recommended dosage for each qualifying condition and the range of chemical composition of any plant of the genus cannabis that will likely be medically beneficial for the qualifying condition. The commissioner shall make this information available to patients with qualifying medical conditions. And so it's really about them doing this research and compiling information and the prescribers or the, the doctors issuing the medical cannabis um, cards would be the ones who are actually responsible for this. And I don't know that any member of the legislature looks at this, but if it's something we rely on, then I'd be happy to reinstate that language. Yeah, um, Madam Chair. Senator uh, Nelson. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I think medical cannabis is still uh, rather new as far as um, its effects, its uh, dosage, all of those things. I would be more comfortable removing this until we could actually uh, get a better handle on how this report is used um, and, in fact, is there good reason to remove that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Nelson, did you want to make a motion? Yes, I will make that motion. amendment. Ms. Kavanagh, could you guide us to how we would make that motion? Madam Chair, so you, um, Senator Nelson, you want to remove that from the repealer? Correct. Okay, so on page um, 5, line 30, uh, delete and 152.25 comma subdivision 2 comma and then on that same line right before 144a.483 insert and and comments questions from members uh, senator I'll give you a minute to look. So I will read you the description that MDH gave us of the report. The commissioner shall report existing medical and scientific literature regarding the range of recommended dosage for each qualified condition, the range of chemical compositions of any plant of the genus cannabis that will likely be medically beneficial for the qualifying medical condition. And members, I don't know if members of the public, uh, Senator Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just, I, I'm probably the only nerd following this, but I think you said page five, line three, and I think you may have meant page five, line 30. Line 30. Okay. Yes. 
That is correct. Thank you. Any questions to the amendment? Any comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, Senator Nelson renews her oral amendment um, on page five, line 30. After the first semicolon, insert and. And after the second semicolon, delete and through the number two inclusive of the comma. Is that accurate, Ms. Kavanagh? Okay, thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. <coughs> Senator Nelson, your amendment's adopted. Any other questions to the A15? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A15 is adopted. Thank you, members. Continuing on the list of amendments, Senator Coran has the A3. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move uh, the amendment A3 um, to Senate File 4198. And members, it should be in your packets. Senator Coran, a brief explanation of the A3. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, um, this is in relation to the uh, medical gas in the implementation of the uh, opioid um, application fees, medical gas was included in that. And so what this ultimately does is removes medical gas suppliers, wholesalers, um, or all the medical gas uh, providers from the $5,260 um, per site fee or the, for the first site fee um, and then to $260. So ultimately removing them. The fiscal impact is just about $250,000 a year. Questions from members? Uh, Senator Utke, comments? I'm sorry, I didn't ask you for comment on the other amendments. <laughs> I apologize, Senator Utke. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no, I like this amendment. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the public as to the A3? Seeing none members, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the A3 amendment is adopted to the a6, uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move uh, an amend, or the amendment uh, A6 to the Senate file 4198. And so, Madam Chair, this is, um, it, re it revolves or revolves around the um, EMSRB um, <coughs> funding. This particular language was passed in the House, or we passed it actually individually, and then <coughs> It was also passed in the House, though, so this is just to normalize the language. But we also do have um, Mr. Ferguson is also online to provide a few comments. And Mr. Ferguson, I have it listed here that you're available for questions, but we would take short comments as it is uh, your area of responsibility. Mr. Ferguson, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Dylan Ferguson. I'm the Executive Director of the uh, Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board. And just as a point of clarification, um, it is my understanding that we are currently on the A6 amendment. Is that correct, Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Ferguson, the A6. Thank you. So as it relates to the A6 amendment, the A6 amendment um, it really revisits language pertaining to ambulance service, uh, ambulance service licensure waivers um, that I previously appeared before this, uh, before this committee on. Um, the House uh, considered uh, similar language, uh, but ultimately chose to uh, approach it from a, a different perspective. Um, and instead of uh, investing the authority within the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board to uh, implement those waivers, um, the proposal before you today is to essentially the, the legislature to grant those authority uh, with uh, administrative reporting requirements uh, placed upon the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board to notify uh, the ranking committees um, and the ranking chairs uh, in, in, in both houses. And ultimately, that was uh, one item that when I appeared before you previously uh, was, was added into the bill to, for those reporting requirements. And the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board supports the A6 Amendment as it really allows some flexibilities for uh, licensed EMS services 
which are still facing some workforce challenges and operational challenges um, as the um, effects of COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, continue to play upon our workforce. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, questions from members to the A6 amendment. And questions or comments from the public on the A6? Seeing none, Senator Curran moves the A6 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The A6 amendment is adopted. Senator Curran, you have the A10 amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move the A10 amendment to Senate File 4198. And please proceed. Senator Curran moves the A-10, please. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment is also for the EMS regional program funding. Um, the amendment is a result of the funding appropriated to the eight regional EMS programs last session in the HHS Omnibus bill, Budget Bill. This funding is, con funding is contained in Minnesota Statute 144E.50 and 144E.52. After the legislation passed, the EMS Regulatory Board noticed that the funding appropriated was referenced in the wrong statute detailing how it may be spent. This amendment has no new spending and it corrects that error. Okay. Questions from members? <coughs> and questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, Senator Curran renews his motion on the A-10. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A-10 is adopted. Continuing to the A13, Senator Abler. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I don't know, this may well again be the best amendment of the day, if it's the last one. Um, it's a very similar topic <coughs> to what we talked about, about the general um, topics, but um, just to help you differentiate it in a way that would be much more succinct than I would do, I'd ask Mr. Monahan to explain how this differs from the previous testimony we had in the other topic, if he can. Can you? A13. So, Senator Abler, did you want Mr. Monahan to explain? Well, I'll move it and then ask him if you would mind okay. explaining it to us. The A13. Right, the A13. Mr. Monahan. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, um, my understanding is this amendment is designed to uh, forestall the Commissioner of Human Services from making any changes to the reimbursement rates for uh, these services and supplies uh, until uh, July 1st, 2023. I believe there's some disagreement about how the new rates that they had proposed to um, implement sometime in June were derived, and this would delay that for a year. Um, my understanding is that this particular problem isn't really related to the other Senate file we heard, which was about establishing a new Medicaid service for similar services and supplies provided to children, but these are two separate issues. Um, thanks. I hope that helps. Well, thanks, Madam Senator Chair. Abler. It's probably not good to admit that I'm confused sometimes, but it was just helpful to get the clarification. I, this whole topic just seems like, could you just, uh, isn't that, that a frozen song, just let it go? I think I said that last year. Um, I will not sing that to the committee, but I would appreciate you, the Senator support Abler. of the amendment. Um, thank you. And comments or questions from the gallery? <laughs> Mr. Zerwas. Thank you, Welcome Madam Chair. Committee, state your name for the record and proceed. Yeah, for the record, my name is Nick Zerwas with the Jacobson Law Group here representing the Midwest Association of Medical Equipment Suppliers. And uh, MAMES is the uh, association of durable medical equipment uh, suppliers throughout the state. Um, we end up, our association, represents the suppliers that uh, provide this enteral formula uh, to individuals that are tube fed or need uh, supplemental uh, nutrition. Um, late last year, I think in the fall, uh, following the 18 month period in which the legislature met uh, continuously monthly uh, due to the ongoing 
uh, public emergency. Uh, I think about within a week of the legislature actually adjourning and stopping meeting monthly is when the department notified all of our members that they would be administratively repricing all of the enteral uh, nutrition products um, that, that our members provide out. And there's a, a significant concern uh, with that and, and how that was approached. We've been in constant uh, communication with the department. They announced a, a repricing procedure and, and an implementation, implementation date of January 1st. Uh, a great many of our members uh, petitioned the commissioner and the governor's office. Um, we got a, a respite of, of a few months uh, to try to work uh, with the department through this legislative session uh, to develop a new uh, procedure in which to uh, come up with the pricing. The department, I'm not, I won't speak for the department, but what they've conveyed to us is their concern that they may be out of compliance with CMS on how this is currently being reimbursed. And so um, at this point, I feel like we are this close, Madam Chair, I feel like we're this close uh, to getting that agreement. There's some language that the department provided a few weeks back that we're trying to get uh, pricing on and see what the fiscal impact will be to our members. And so um, to that end, we wanted some kind of placeholder language in here um, to help encourage all parties uh, to continue to negotiate uh, for the next seven weeks. Questions from members, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just, to me, it just seems like it's the same topic. And I realize there's technical differences about it, but um, just to anybody who's been watching this topic for the last how many years, Madam Chair? Uh, just if it's not clear about, I mean, legislative intent isn't the law, but I think it's the intent of this committee and pretty much the entire legislature to quit messing with this stuff and let these folks continue to save lives and keep people in their homes so that they don't have to go into someplace much more expensive and much worse to, I mean, you no, know, just in much less, you know, desirable to get there early. So um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Zerwas and, and Senator Aki for carrying this. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from members? Okay. Uh, Senator Abler renews his motion on the 813 amendment. All those in favor, favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The 813 is adopted. Now, members, you should have just received the 812 amendment. It is a technical amendment. Senator Dreheim, do you want to explain it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, Madam Chair, I would. Um, on line one, no, I'm kidding. It is a technical uh, amendment. I would like to move uh, the 812 to send out file 4188. And Senator Dreheim moves the 812. Um, Ms. Kavanaugh, or perhaps Mr. Albrecht, can you just walk us through the spent, unspent versus unexpended, and obviously then some date changes? Does anybody want to take this one on? It seems, it seems obvious, but unspent versus unexpended. Somebody will, somebody will ask. Well, I can do the I can do the date changes. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Kavanor. Um, 2013 has already occurred. So. Yep. <laughs> okay. Good. And then. I can do better than the the date changes, Madam Chair. Mr. Albrecht. <laughs> um, it's just the unspent versus unexpended is just a technical term that we we make expenditures, we don't spend money. Okay, thank you. Any questions as to the Dreheim A12? Seeing none, Senator Dreheim moves the A12. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A12 amendment is adopted. Let's check for any other amendments. Those are the amendments that the chair has been made aware of, Senator Wickland. Senator Wickland, uh, has the amendment been made available to the committee? I believe it has, and I, I apologize. It was <clears throat> it was later than I had hoped, but it's the A11 amendment. I believe, Ms. Governor, you it was posted. Okay, and Senator Wickland 
but we don't have copies, we don't so have, we need we to move the A11. I just wanted to yes. get it out before the public, and if you could uh, walk us through what the amendment does. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, this is an amendment that has to do with the um, Collaborative Dental Hygiene Practice Program, which is a, a program that we have in place, but it's been very underutilized um, here in Minnesota. And the original bill that this language is from is was authored by Senator Senjum, and it's um, Senate File 3963. Um, it's not a scope of practice bill, but it um, has to do with this Collaborative Dental Hygiene Practice Program, and it would remove administrative barriers that exist in the program um, and that have prevented uh, most hygienists from participating. Um, and it provides, um, the collaborative program provides preventive dental care and education in community settings. That's what this program is limited to. Uh, the Board of Dentistry is supportive of the changes and the Minnesota Department of Health is supportive of the program. Um, they issued a report um, last October about understanding collaborative dental hygiene practice in Minnesota and indicated in one of their recommendations that um, removing the, the barrier, um, removing barriers would be helpful to greater implementation of the program, such as uh, removing the requirement to set up a 501c3 or nonprofit status in order to receive the direct payments. Um, so I've worked with um, Tara Erickson, and she is here representing the Minnesota Dental Hygiene Association, and she can uh, speak to the language as well. Uh, we also received an email um, today and on, also on Monday um, from Apple Tree Dental in support of this uh, language uh, moving forward. Um, I think that this is a program that can increase health equity in our state. It helps reach populations that are um, not able to access um, dental health care as easily. And by making these changes um, to the language of the program, more dental hygienists would be able to participate in the program. And I think um, you may have received, or I've received um, contacts from dental hygienists kind of all across Minnesota um, who are interested in participating in this collaborative practice program but are unable to do so because of the, the barrier of needing to have a nonprofit status um, organization to participate with. And maybe Ms. Erickson could uh, provide additional uh, testimony. Thank you. I'll go first to Senator Utke, Ms. Erickson, and then the department. I'd appreciate mm -hmm. the department to comment on the report in here. Mm -hmm. Senator Utke, thoughts to the amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would take this as a, a friendly amendment it's something that has just come before us here recently, so, uh, but we'll hear what others have to say, but I don't know of anything bad. Okay, thank <laughs> At you. this point, it, it looks like there's only an upside to it, so thank you. And Ms. Erickson, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Tara Erickson, and I'm here today representing the Minnesota um, Hygiene Dental Association. Um, all this is is making a change currently right now um, DHS is interpreting that a hygienist who wants to go out and provide preventive services in a community setting such as Head Start schools um, it could be a long-term care facility must actually form a 501c3 and so the folks who have done that have made this their job um, and they have started 501c3s are out providing care, it is their full-time job. But there are some that just wanna be able to do this part-time, and so we're just we're um, going to eliminate that barrier of having to do that and just let a licensed dentist um, be able to collaborate with them. So there is no scope of practice, I just want to say that for the record, zero <laughs> scope <laughs> issues in this, and um, thank you very much for saying that this is a friendly amendment. Thank you, and to the department, um, there is a report uh, as we look at page two, line 32. So we anticipate there'll be a cost to the department. I'm looking for Mr. Reese. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, you'll go with Joe Hayes with the Minnesota Department of Human Services. We don't have any objections to the report. I think the 
I'm not sure that a fiscal note has been completed on the report, but we don't have any objections with the content of it. Um, and so, Mr. Reese, are you saying the department can absorb the cost of that report? Uh, Madam Chair, no, I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm saying we, I, don't, I don't believe we've provided a uh, fiscal note on the report as of yet, and so I think we're still reviewing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reese. And just keep in mind, there are other places in this bill where we eliminate reports, so maybe it'll be a wash, Mr. Reese. Okay, no comment. <laughs> Madam <laughs> Chair, <laughs> we, Ms. Erickson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've, we can deal with that in finance um, if need be. We just really wanted the data to be able to show um, how collaborative practice is helping with preventive care out in the communities. And if there's going to be a cost, we are absolutely willing to take that out for the okay. time being. But we just, we just really need uh, the program fixed. Good news. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wickland, actually, I'm going to ask the committee if they have comments, then we'll go to Senator Wickland. Seeing no comments from the committee, Senator Wickland, anything to close? Um, no, I just would really appreciate it if we can <clears throat> add this language. I really appreciate your accepting the amendment. Um, I, I've heard from a number of hygienists um, this week that this would allow them to make um, contributions in the community and, and I think we need to be encouraging that where we can to, to help with the um, lack of dental services in some parts of our state. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Seeing no further comments or questions, Senator Wickland renews her motion on the A11. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A11 is adopted. Thank you, Senator Wickland. Any further amendments from members? Okay, um, there is a technical amendment. Uh, Senator Utke, I'm gonna uh, have you move on the delete everything amendment, page 92, line 27, in the title, in the word adjustment, we need to make that adjustments. And so let's add an S, is that correct, Mr. Albrecht? Any questions? Senator Aki moves to insert an S to the word adjustment on page 92, line 27. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, members. Now, um, now that we've adopted all the amendments I'm aware of, I'd ask for comments from the public as to, uh, the, to the bill as amended. I have Mr. Graves, Ms. Crinky, Ms. Vele, I believe. So those are the first three testifiers I have listed. If you could come up to let us know that you're here or on Zoom, make sure your video is on. Mr. Graves, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. We represent uh, more than 6,000 employers across the state and, and uh, more than 500,000 em employees in all industries in the state, all corners of the state. Um, and I want to I wanna today voice our support for the provisions in the bill taken from Senator Benson's Senate File 1257, Senator Rosen's Senate File 3071, uh, and Senator Nelson's Senate File 2302. So we encourage state leaders to find new ways to reduce barriers that may exist uh, to prevent or hamper the movement of interested individuals into the workforce generally. But the need for action is related to how the healthcare sector is particularly urgent. The COVID-19 pandemic upended life in virtually ec every economic sector, but its impact on the healthcare sector will be felt for many years to come. For many reasons, the challenges that all employers face with regard to attracting and training talented workers have been multiplied in the healthcare sector by the pandemic. The provisions related to duplicative background checks and temporary permits for healthcare workers will help ensure that those who wish to provide their services to the healthcare sector can do so through processes that are timely, efficient, and provide certainty. Similarly, bringing Minnesota into the Nurse Licensure Compact offers hospitals and healthcare providers the opportunity to draw from a larger pool of nursing talent to fill the increasing demand for nursing care in their operations. Joining the NLC will provide those local health care organizations with another tool in their toolbox as they work to meet these, the expectations of their communities. 
It also allows Minnesota nurses to better care for their patients who may frequently travel outside the state, ensuring better outcomes and care coordination for those patients without having to deal with the cost and burden of obtaining and maintaining additional state licenses. This is a benefit that will become increasingly important as the healthcare industry pivots to more services being provided via virtual care and telehealth in the years to come. Given the important work before all of us to address workforce shortages as a strategy to ensure economic growth and opportunity in the years ahead, we want to thank Chair Aki and the Senators who carried and championed these important provisions contained in this bill. And we want to offer our full support in an effort to help put Minnesota in the best position possible to meet the ever-increasing demand for workers and talent. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Ms. Krinke, and then uh, we'll move to Dan Andreessen and then Lisa Timian. Welcome Madam to the committee, state your name for the record and proceed. Great. Madam Chair, members of the Crinky, <laughs> Madam Chair and members <laughs> of the committee. Uh, my name is Mary Crinky and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. I just want to thank the committee for several of the bills that are included in this omnibus bill and appreciate the committee including the two hospital moratorium projects, one for Children's Hospital and one for the critical access hospitals collectively. That will be very helpful. Also, we do support the Nurse Licensure Compact. But I really want to focus on the two bills that were mentioned that we've been working on now uh, with the background check and the fingerprint with Senator Benson. We've been working on that bill for over two years now. And we have gotten agreement with the Department of Human Services and with the boards. And it is really time to pass this bill. And so I am hopeful that everything that has now been agreed to, we know of no opposition. So if we can't get bills across the finish line that have been worked out by all the parties that are involved, it, it, the, we just really need this process to work and to be able to get that bill across the finish line. So just want to thank everyone and the department for their work on the background check and fingerprinting. Also want to mention the bill of Senator Rosen's regarding temporary permits. Um, we've looked all around the country and most other states do allow temporary permits for healthcare professionals that are duly licensed in good standing in their home states. So our temporary permit for four categories of healthcare professionals, physicians, physicians, assistants, respiratory therapists, and nurses would be consistent across all four categories. The boards have worked on this language. The boards are supportive of this language. Many states have 180 days or six months. So our bill at 90 days is less than most states. So just would like to urge those two provisions. If there's anything we can do to get those across the finish line, we would be gratefully appreciative of that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Krinke. Next, Mr. Andreessen, and then Ms. Timian. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans, a trade association representing Minnesota's nonprofit insurers. Just want to thank you for a couple additions in, in the bill. Uh, first of all, Senate File 2302, Senator Nelson's Nurse Licensure Compact Bill. Uh, this is a positive step forward to address the workforce needs in our state and also increase patient safety and health care access. Also, thank you for adding in uh, Senate File 3580, uh, Senator Coran's bill on um, dentist uh, data. Um, for years, the state has been working to increase MA dental access rates here in the state. And last year, the state made a significant investment to increase reimbursement rates for dentists treating those on MA. Uh, along with that, there was going to be a study that DHS would be doing to collect um, data to see how those rates were impacting um, access rates. Um, and this is just an additional data point for DHS to collect to make sure that we're getting a full picture of the impact of these reimbursements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andreessen. Next, Thank you. Ms. Timian. Believe you are. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as always, I appreciate your understanding of how to pronounce my name. Um, for the record, my name is Lisa Timian, and I'm the Legislative Director at the Minnesota Department of Health. I just wanted to briefly speak to the A2 Amendment, and while I'm pleased to see some of the Health Department's related activities included, I just want to raise again a few of the Health Department's concerns and add a little bit of information that we didn't uh, raise in previous hearings. As you recall, on Monday, you heard from our Assistant Commissioner, Dan Huff, about closed-loop key to change systems. Just wanted to reiterate that the variance process remains the Department's preferred approach for these experimental systems. 
This process involves evaluating applications when deviation from rules is requested. This works to ensure that there are provisions for safety and public health that are equivalent to the existing rule. And these safeguards are in place to protect groundwater from potential contamination and ensure safe drinking water for all Minnesotans. In 2021, our well management section evaluated 168 applications and approved 86% of those. I'll also add that the base criteria for variance evaluation is the combination of statute and rules, also known as the Minnesota Well Code. This well code serves as the floor of minimum construction and safety criteria. Well contractors are trained on this well code annually and it is posted on our website. I also wanted to raise uh, a few points from last week's discussion in this committee about variances in Minnesota pool code. And just as a reminder, the pool code is in place to ensure safe operation, both from infection control and life safety perspective, because users of hot tubs expect them to be safe. Um, from 2012 to 2021 in Minnesota, we had two deaths related to Legionella. In pools and hot tubs, 31 drowning deaths in public pools and hot tubs, and 30 drowning deaths in residential pools and hot tubs. Unfortunately, drowning remains a leading cause of death for children, which is one reason why we feel like these facilities should be uh, <clears throat> continue to be regulated and not exempt. And also, we have other uh, diseases and outbreaks and injuries that we can share as well with health the committee. And with that. I uh, thank you again for the committee's time. I look forward to working with you over the coming weeks to get an HHS bill. Thank you, Ms. Timian. And I have no further members of the public who wish to testify. I'm going to go to uh, members of the committee and then Senator Aki for a close. Mm -hmm. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I wanted to start with. Uh, Again, I have concerns from a public health perspective on Senator Box, uh, Senate File 2145 um, with the hot tubs. Um, we had quite a um, bunch of them at one time that a lot of people got the, the hot tub rash, the Pseudomonas folliculitis. And I'm not sure if we want that all over the northern part of this state. but. Um, I hope that there's at least some options for people to um, do some prevention with uh, uh, some forms of antibacterial wipes or something. Um, the other one is, um, I don't understand uh, Senate File 3574, why Senator Dreheim wants to move the, um, um, well, that's not the one I wanted to talk about. My mistake, sorry. Um, I guess the last thing I wanted to say was the uh, the nurse licensure compact, which I still um, strongly oppose. Uh, this does not help the issues with uh, nurse staffing shortages. And um, if you follow the news at all, we recently had one of our traveling nurses actually take their life. Um, the stresses and the um, the uh, just the anguish of not being able to practice as a nurse the way you've been trained and do what you have a passion to do to help um, improve someone's health is um, is pretty overwhelming and these people have been through a lot with the pandemic etc and the staffing shortages and um, as I've said before this is um, this is pretty offensive to, to nurses at the bedside Uh, Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a, a few comments. Um, in the bill itself, I, I think there are some good things that I think we um, should be happy about moving forward and continuing discussion on. Um, I am glad to see that we're taking some action on the background studies and reducing the duplicate um, nature of um, the what's happening today. I hope that we can um, make things happen in that area this year. Um, and I have expressed in the past my opposition to the nurse licensure compact, and um, I'm not in favor of that being in this bill, but um, have expressed my opinion about that not being, a, uh, I don't think, a helpful um, addition for Minnesota. Um, a couple of things that I just wanted to mention that I that aren't in the bill that I 
I had hoped we would be able to have discussion on in the committee. I had a bill, um, it was Senate file uh, 4166 that has to do with providing a method for or a requirement for screening for eligibility for health coverage for uh, patients who are in, in a hospital setting and it would allow them to um, learn about um, their uh, ability to get covered by, um, you know, by public programs um, and um, could alleviate uh, issues with being able to pay for their hospital services. Uh, this is something that the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition has worked on uh, with the Hospital Association and um, they had worked out some language um, that would be a no cost uh, policy change um, that could improve um, health care coverage for, for Minnesotans. Um, so that one I, I would hope that we could maybe have, continue to have some more discussion on if the House includes it in their, their bills. Um, and then um, also just it's probably uh, more, has a budget impact um, and I'm not sure that we're, we're doing a um, health um, omnibus that's a financial omnibus, um, but I also I had a bill, uh, Senate file 3910, that had to do with um, ensuring that um, Medicaid uh, patients could have access to long-acting reversible contraception immediately postpartum. Um, and I would like to think that we could still keep on talking about um, whether that's uh, still an opportunity to, to move forward this, this session as well. Um, and then we, we didn't hear, um, have any discussion about um, home visiting this session, but I just would like to be a, an advocate for the bills that are, um, were introduced this year. I know Senator Coleman has a bill, and then I had introduced um, Senate File 3766, um, which would be for a um, universal home visiting program to try and address um, family needs here in the post um, pandemic or you know the aftermath of the pandemic, um, helping families connect with um, home, vi home visiting services I think would be really helpful at this time. So just some, some comments and some other items that um, hopefully we can maybe have more discussion on. So thank you. Further questions or comments from members, Senator Nelson. Thank well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just want to thank uh, Senator Utke for bringing this uh, well-rounded bill to us, uh, particularly uh, Senator Utke. I'm glad to see that you've included the compacts that can help our medical professionals treat their patients where they are and can also further uh, facilitate the use of, of telehealth, which has become so important. And I, I did particularly want to thank you for including the nurse licensure compact. Uh, nurses su support that. About 10 to 1 patients need it. Telehealth requires it. And uh, we need to allow our, our nurses to follow their patients. So I want to thank you for including that as well. Seeing no further comments, Senator Utke, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for... Uh, participating in this here today and throughout the uh, uh, session so far as we heard these bills and now we've put some of them together. The, the one comment and we've had, we had the nurse licensure compact before us, bill before us earlier. We've had multiple conversations about it and um, I just wanted to add a little of the data that I have learned on this uh, from across the country that uh, various meetings I attended and it's just, it's kind of one more thing that justifies it as something that we need here in the state with me and um, currently going forward we're uh, national statistics show that we'll be losing through retirement and all different sources 200,000 nurses from the workforce each year we only have the ability to train 180,000 per year and this is nationally so this is across the country so even with that we're going backwards and of those 180,000, how many stay with nursing or is this the first step to something, further training, further schooling, um, and they work in some other related profession. So with our current numbers that are out there, we can see what nationally we're gonna have a battle. Um, we're, we're just not bringing enough new nurses on, so at some point uh, we hope that that 
catches up or balances out again. But here in Minnesota, because of the way we license our nurses, I am hearing new nurse candidates or those that are graduating, they don't even stop in Minnesota to get their license. They jump out of state right away to go to a state where they can get into the compact and move around. And we all know that um, the younger we are, the more apt we're to move a lot more frequently. Um, and that freedom to move, um, currently we were at 39 states with more, um, considering it this year, we're going to be up in the mid-40s fairly fast. The, the United States or the whole country is their, their place that they can go to work, and we would really be an outlier. So that's why um, I look at this personally as being something uh, very important, and it's, it's great to have in here, and we'll move it forward and see where we can uh, land with this. But, uh, you know, I, through conversations uh, around the country, not just in Minnesota, this seems to be something that we can use as a large benefit rather than something that uh, would be a negative to our state. Uh, it's just got nothing but a lot of positives. So with that, members, just again, I thank you for uh, um, all the work you've done. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I would renew my motion that Senate File 4198 be passed as amended and re-referred to the Finance Committee. All those in favor of the ECQ motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. <coughs> Senate File 4198 is passed. Thank you, Senator Ecke. Thank Any you, Madam Chair. Comments, uh, Senator Ecke, for further committee action? Oh, <laughs> I know that we're going to have, we've got bills up on Monday, yeah. so we will, uh, we'll have work to do yet. Um, you just... Uh, I guess sitting in this chair, I wasn't expecting it's just, that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank but you. But we, we will Members, have stuff to do. With no further business before the committee, we are adjourned.